You may remember this bookshelf speaker right here. If not, then let me tell you that I turned its sibling into a portable boombox during a previous project video. During that process I not only temporarily removed the loudspeakers, but also got rid of the utilized audio crossover in favor of a new one that I got from eBay. Lots of viewers though seem to disagree with this replacement decision. So in this video we will find out how exactly audio crossovers and thus passive filters function and how to theoretically calculate those in order to find out whether it makes sense to replace an existing audio crossover or even create a DIY one. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB, where you can get prototype PCBs for only $2, which will be getting produced within only 24 hours. Also JLC PCB increased their customer number by 300,000 during the last year. So become a satisfied customer as well by uploading your Gerber files today. Before we have a closer look at the old audio crossover, let's firstly have a look at a typical audio signal. This smartphone audio signal would obviously need to get amplified before entering the audio crossover and finally the loudspeakers. But by having a look at the signal on the oscilloscope, we can already find out that we are dealing with an AC signal that features frequencies from 20 up to 20,000 Hz. This wide frequency band is the reason why our bookshelf speaker features one woofer, which is the big loudspeaker, and one tweeter, which is the small loudspeaker. The woofer with its big size comes with a lot more inertia, meaning it can move slower but pushes more air. This makes it perfect for low frequent tones between 40 and 2000 Hz, which it can play back without any distortions. Of course it can also play higher frequencies, but volume and quality reductions can be the consequences. That is where the small and agile tweeter comes in, which can play back frequencies above 2000 Hz without reduced volume or quality. So since the two loudspeakers are clearly designed for a specific frequency band, the job of the audio crossover is to separate the frequencies of the amplified audio signal into high and low frequencies. To do that it apparently uses resistors, capacitors and inductors, whose function we can experimentally determine with a test setup which connects my function generator in series to each component and the loudspeaker. As a substitute for the loudspeaker however, I will be using a 4 ohm resistor to match its resistance. And I will also be using an amplifier between the function generator and loads, because the generator alone would not be able to supply the required output power. First off, let's connect a small 2 ohm resistor, which is close to what is used for the actual audio crossover. And let's hook up the input and output voltage to my oscilloscope. By choosing a sine voltage whose frequency we slowly increase, we can see that the output voltage maximum pretty much stays constant at a value of 3.4 volts, no matter the frequency. This output voltage level can easily be calculated by Ohm's law, which means a resistor does damp our audio signal, but sadly across the whole frequency range. So let's move on by connecting a 150 microhenry inductor, which is close to one of the audio crossover inductor values. By once again increasing the frequency, we can see that the maximum of the output voltage slowly decreases. That means with a higher frequency, the resistance of the inductor needs to increase. Which is actually correct, because the inductive reactance rises proportional with the frequency. And if that confuses you right now, then definitely have a look at my video about impedance. Anyway, this experiment shows us that we could use an inductor to damp high frequent voltages, which means the inductor alone would act as a low pass filter. 
Now, if we try the same experiment with a 10 microfarad capacitor, which I stole from the audio crossover, then we can see that with a higher frequency, the maximum of the output voltage stays pretty high, and only with lower frequencies, the maximum decreases. Once again, the reactance, in this case the capacitive reactance, is responsible for the high resistance and low frequencies. That means a capacitor alone would act as a high-pass filter. With this knowledge, all we would have to do is to connect a suitable inductor in series to the woofer and a capacitor in series to the tweeter in order to create a simple crossover. But since the commercial crossover features a lot more components, this may not be the optimal solution yet. So let's move on to the popular RC filter which, like the name implies, consists of a resistor and capacitor, whose position can be swapped to build up either a high-pass or low-pass filter. Since the high-pass filter is pretty similar to the example we already talked about, let's for now focus on the low-pass filter, where the output voltage drops across the capacitor and the input voltage across the resistor and capacitor. That means we build up a voltage divider, and by doing a little mathematical magic, we can find out that the formula for the output voltage looks like this. As an example, let's use a 10 microfarad capacitor, 10 ohm resistor, a max input voltage of 5 volts, and a frequency of 5 kHz, which should give us an output voltage of 1.51 volts. After building up the circuits and measuring the output voltage, we can see that our equation was in fact correct. Another important value for all filters is the cutoff frequency, which is the frequency where the output voltage is 0.707 times the input voltage, which converted to decibel is a damping of minus 3 dB. The formula for the cutoff frequency for the RC high pass and low pass filter is the same and looks like this. So with our previous example values, we would get a cutoff frequency of 1591 Hz, which by adjusting the function generator to this frequency seems to be correct. Above this frequency, the low pass filter damps the output signal with minus 20 dB per decade which means 0.1 times the previous input value per every 10 times the frequency. The high pass filter obviously damps the output voltage with minus 20 dB per decade underneath its cutoff frequency. Now of course we could also replace the capacitor with an inductor and thus create an RL high pass and low pass filter as well. The formulas for the cutoff frequencies are once again identical for both filters, and the damping curve is also pretty much the same in theory. The reason why RC filters are preferred though are the higher costs and size of coils, while also featuring a higher dissipation factor in comparison to capacitors, which means they feature more real resistance in relation to the reactants which is not ideal and for example causes more power losses. So with those basics out of the way, I finally started reverse engineering the old audio crossover and found out that it uses a rather complex combination of RLC components to create two filters. Calculating those can be quite challenging. So let's firstly find out why the circuit partly only uses L and C components. The reason is that our RC and RL filters only offer a damping of minus 20 dB, which means unwanted frequencies will take a while to be completely filtered out. Such filters are called first order filters, because they come with one frequency dependent components. So to get a second order filter, we can simply combine an inductor and capacitor to form an LC high pass or LC low pass filter. This way the damping increases to minus 40 dB per decade, which removes unwanted frequencies above or beneath the cutoff frequencies much quicker. And speaking of cutoff frequency, the formula for the high pass and low pass is like always the same and is for my simple example here around 4.1 kHz, 
which by doing another simple measurement seems to be correct. Now sadly, those simple formulas do not work with such crazy filters. But to make our life easier, we can simply download the Vitux Cat 2 software, in which we can rebuild the old filter design to find out that we got one low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of around 700 Hz and one high pass filter, which pretty much always features a damping of underneath minus 3 dB. I also confirmed those values by doing a couple of measurements with the crossover. So after reverse engineering my replacement crossover, I found out that it does not feature the same filter curves. Which is bad because every loudspeaker comes with its own frequency response, since a loudspeaker is partly a frequency dependent inductor, for which the original manufacturer created a precisely tuned audio crossover to get the best sound quality. So all in all, we learned that my audio crossover replacement was stupid and that DIYing an audio crossover is definitely possible with the Vitwix CAT2 software, at least if you got the frequency response file for your loudspeaker. But don't think filters are only useful for audio applications, because they are also used for mains filters or for example to turn a high frequent sinusoidal PWM signal into a proper sine wave. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If so, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hitting the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time!